getting ready to begin on the topic of creating more engaging learning experiences. So we'll be beginning in less than one minute. Great, welcome everyone. We will begin. So hello and welcome to a future workplace webinar on creating more engaging learning experiences. My name is Kevin Mulcahy. I'm a partner here at Future Workplace. Today's webinar will focus on new insights on creating more engaging learning experiences. Simply put, more engaging learning experiences enables organizations to more effectively train their employees, partners, customers, and students. Online learning experiences are proving to be as effective as in-person training programs, but can be deployed faster and reach across entire organizations driving business transformation. And that's why we're here today. In this session, you will find out how NovaEd Training Platform has helped a large pharmaceutical company significantly reduce its time to market by delivering product training exactly where and when it was needed. So a little bit about future workplace. Um, our mission is essentially to promote the development of senior HR leaders like yourselves by providing actionable insights on the future of learning and working. Organizations use future workplace research and insights to future-proof their learning and talent strategies. A few quick housekeeping details. We will be recording this webinar and we will make the link available to you within 48 hours. So by Friday afternoon, you will receive an email with the link to this presentation and with the presentation itself. So this is a little bit of an interactive webinar. So on the bottom right of your screen, please use the Q&A window uh, to, we do want and encourage ongoing conversation and interactions and feel free to ask questions at any time during this webinar. We will take some of the questions as we go. We'll store others for that little section towards the end as part of our wrap up. Also, we will have a couple of polls prepared as part of the program today. Please do share your thoughts. You'll get about 10 or 15 seconds to make your responses to the polls. And you can add, again, additional comments in the chat client or in the Q&A window. And we do look forward to hearing your ideas as we go. And finally, um, to continue the conversation, uh, here are some Twitter handles. Um, today, I'll be joined by Greg Bybee, who is VP of Customer Experience and Marketing, and he, you can follow him on Twitter at, at Greg Bybee. I'll also be joined by Wendy Chase, President and Owner of Chase Consulting. You can follow her on Twitter at Wendy L. Chase. So to join and follow the conversation during or after this webinar, please also um, use the, our company Twitter handles at Future Workplace and at Go Novo Ed. So you can also uh, now uh, follow our presenters, follow our companies. So let me now turn it over the presentation to Greg Bybee of Novo Ed to share his insights into the transformative effect of online learning within organizations. Greg, welcome to the Future Workplace webinar. So, great, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, as you mentioned in this session, we wanna cover <clears throat> what we're seeing organizations doing to drive um, business impact through online learning. And we thought it'd be helpful to have two perspectives. One from a solution provider, in this case, NovoEd, who is working in the space and building products to help organizations deliver more effective learning. And then also a perspective from a practitioner, like probably most of yourselves on the call, who's sort of living and breathing this and has actually implemented these solutions. So I'll kick off for about seven to eight minutes to do the uh, solution provider perspective and what we're seeing, and then we'll turn it over to sort of the main act of the show, Wendy Chase, uh, who runs Chase Consulting Group and has a very distinguished career in sales training and pharmaceutical training. Uh, in fact, Wendy and I gave this presentation just last week at the Future Workplace, uh, Future of Learning and Working event in Las Vegas. And I wanted to sort of bring in some of the lessons that we heard from that session as well, uh, from the conversations and all of the great, um, great presentations. 
And I would say the biggest theme that I heard, oh, oh there. The biggest theme across the entire event was the importance of digital transformation and learning and how many organizations are going through this and some struggling uh, with this transformation. But what was interesting was everyone was going through the transformation for different reasons uh, and at different times. So a couple of the reasons that we heard that, that really resonated with me were first this idea of today's learner. Um, so part of this, of course, are digital natives, the millennials or the next generation that's coming into the workforce uh, that wants to learn in new ways, expects easy to use technologies, expects mobile uh, and flexibility. But what we're seeing is it's not just the next generation, it's really the entire workforce that's evolving and becoming much more comfortable with technology and expects uh, much more flexible learning environments. Uh, a second trend that consistently comes up, uh, unsurprisingly, is cost. Um, costs are going up, particularly for travel, for hotel, for T&E and flights, uh, and budgets are remaining flat, and in some cases even declining. And then a lot of organizations have environmental policies to reduce travel as well. And so there's really this need to bring more of the in-person training and the in-person programs online. Another reason for this, which, which connects to the travel costs, of course, is globalization. And we saw this across the event, but also a number of, of our customers, what really initially brings them to us is that they're expanding their back office. Their sales force is going across the globe. Maybe they've done some M&A and they've, they've expanded their footprint globally now, and it's just no longer possible to fly everybody in to a central location, to headquarters, and even regional or geographic uh, workshops and meetings are becoming harder to organize. We've also started to see a number of customers come to us with this need to train the extended workforce. This is sort of the freelancers, contract workers, or the gig economy. And this is actually a learning for me that when you're working with contract workers, uh, you can't quote unquote train them. Uh, providing formal training programs would be considered a uh, qualification for employment. And so it's important to draw a distinction. And online learning has actually been found to be a way that you can do that, that you can create communities of practice and learning environments or allow people to connect with each other uh, that's less formal than bringing everyone in. But the ones that get me excited are, the, are these two at the bottom. And the first of these is sort of business agility or the need for HR and L&D to be more agile, to be able to get training up and running much more quickly. The traditional model of kind of rolling out an in-person training across the globe, running a train-to-trainer session, launching it locally, and then starting to just cascade that globally, you know, it just takes months to actually get out. And what we see consistently is by the time the final training rolls out <clears throat> at a sort of regional office, uh, it's no longer up to date. And you get this feeling of people being left behind or always lagging behind six months. And so we've got to move to where everyone's getting the same training at the same time and you're able to iterate much more quickly. Launch it, run it, get feedback, and then change it within, within minutes or at least days at the least uh, before the next offering. And the biggest, what this all culminates to is really driving business impact. And actually kind of a theme of, of what I'm gonna share is this, a lot of the best training, the best learning is happening, uh, is only available to the people who are able to come in person. And because of those costs, because of all the reasons above, it's often limited only to a small percentage of the workforce. And it's really critical that the most important training is being able to cascade throughout the organization and reach everyone. And online learning is, is a great way to do that. But what's most surprising then, uh, when I look at the data and I, I read sort of the Burson reports and ATD and, and Training Industry Magazine, all these reports showed this massive uptake in online learning, um, started with computer-based training, CBT, and then um, online learning over the past 10, 20 years. But it's actually starting to slow down. You know, it's still, it's still increasing, but it's increasing by small percentage points each year, whereas five years ago, it was still making massive jumps. And I think part of what's happening and part of what we see when we look at the data is that the online training today is what's supporting um, content delivery, some of the basic training. And so that moved online very quickly because it was sort of the low-hanging fruit. It was relatively easy to, to migrate online. But what's still offline are those higher order skill development and behavioral change. 
And that's a lot harder for people to be able to migrate online. So the low-hanging fruit is, uh, is all plucked, if you will, and now we're on to the tough stuff. So I want to take a moment here to ask uh, the attendee, that I'd love to hear your, your perspective. Um, so what, start with the compliance training. So I sort of take an extreme example of maybe the most um, rote knowledge. What percent of your compliance training is delivered either fully online or mostly online? And I'll, poll should be open now. Basically, it's just, uh, just a rough estimate. I know you won't know exactly off the top of your head, but just sort of ballpark is it, you know, a quarter or, you know, a fifth, um, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, five fifths. Uh, and just overall, Greg, do you, do you, without giving away the answer here, do you see um, this number moving over time? Is it increasing or decreasing? Well, that's, I mean, I'm curious to see what the results are, but I would say that, that's sort of the, you know, what I was getting at with the previous slide is that I, I think this number has increased dramatically over the past five years. Um, and now my hunch, and we'll see actually the data starting to come in, is that the vast majority of compliance training is delivered online today. And um, it looks like the poll has ended, so it's seeing about 87% um, of folks have the you know, vast majority, uh, 80 plus percent online, 6% um, have 60 to 80. And then it looks like just a couple, one or I don't know how many we have in here, but a couple organizations are um, very little online. Uh, that's very interesting. I'd love to follow up with those and hear, hear what interesting uh, regulations or what's what's driving that. Wow. So now let's so now let's flip uh, and get the other side of it and click over. So for poll number two, so same question, but this time thinking about your leadership development programs. So the higher order um, management, leadership, presence, uh, feedback, these sort of executive type programs. What percent of those are delivered either mostly or fully online? And you can vote in the lower right hand corner. Okay. Great. Well, wow, this is very, um, even stronger results than I, than I expect. They're stronger in terms of skewed. So it looks like about 56% are in the, the, the lower 20%, uh, that less than 20% of leadership development programs are mostly or fully online. Uh, and then it's sort of spread out, about 12% being in the, the next bucket, 16%. Uh, and only 4% are 80 plus percent online. And this is actually, I think, a, you know, I mean, a fantastic results in terms of making the point. And it actually kind of aligns to what we see uh, across the industry. So this is a report from a training industry. Uh, you, the link there is online if you want to read the full report. But they asked the same question of their, of their members and found that over 50% of compliance training across their organization or across their members is delivered mostly or fully online. And you can sort of see the chart here as you move up into the more high, it almost perfectly aligns the more up you move, the more higher order, the more interpersonal, maybe the softer the skills, uh, the more it becomes delivered in person. So executive development and management, uh, sort of less than 10%, mostly online. And this is really what got me interested in this problem and, and really what NovoEd is trying to tackle is, you know, why is it that so much of the compliance and the knowledge-based training has moved online, but what I would argue is the most important training, so the executive development, management, sales, uh, customer service, uh, employee onboarding, building these, these cultures, uh, those are still stuck offline. So one reason for this is that is how we think about the LMS and how we think about the way people learn. So I mentioned earlier sort of the next generation, the millennials, the digital natives, um, but it's really across the entire workforce. And the way that they want to learn today and the way that they do learn uh, is very different, uh, or maybe it's just in, it's enabled differently than it used to be. But this is a report Degree did when they asked, I think it was about 500 or so uh, employees, how do they get new information when they want to learn a new, a new task or a new process? And by far, and it's not too surprising, they're going to a peer, either a boss, a mentor, or a peer at the office are by far where they go first. They go to social learning. And then 
they search for it on demand. They go to the internet, they Google it, um, they'll maybe browse their own resources and they'll see what's available. And very few, only 28% of people said that they ever go to their LMS as a source for learning. And so as a result, the LMS is no longer being sort of pulled by the learners, it's something that's being pushed onto the learners. And that's sort of why it's being used for the mandatory compliance training where you can mandate it, thou shalt do this. But for the uh, higher order skills, uh, it's really not as effective. And the second thing is if you think about these skills that are at the top of that list that are still being delivered in person, leadership, design thinking, innovation, strategy, customer service, sales, culture. What all these have in common is that they require this action learning. They're incredibly important to the organization, but they require hands-on, project-based learning, experiential learning. Um, there's something that really can't be boiled down to just a couple of slides. And this makes a lot of sense. So just, just take a moment and think about your best learning experience, where you learn something really challenging or you really confronted a, a pre-existing belief uh, when you came out of a program change. You know, was it a lecture, was it an online course, or was it an in-person workshop? And I thought about having a poll on this as well, but the results are always just so skewed. You know, it's, it's the workshops. It's, it's, on the, it's like on-the-job learning. It's usually in-person. Uh, it's experiential, it's collaborative, it's a group of people working, working together. And I recently completed a, a Master's of Education, and this actually struck me as well when learning the sort of pedagogy and science of learning, is we know this to be most effective. Learning has to be applied. It has to be constructivist. It has to be collaborative. It has to be hands-on, project-based, case-based, problem-based. Pick your, pick your pedagogy buzzword. But this is how great learning happens. But if you look at online learning, Online learning has really focused on replicating the lecture hall. It's a click next to continue, it's slides, sort of stage on the stage model of videos, quizzes, PowerPoints, and so forth. And so really what the workforce needs today is for online learning to feel more like that great in-person learning. We need online learning to look and feel like project-based workshops. And that's what NovoEd's working on, um, so here's the the quick little commercial about us is we've built a learning platform that's able to replicate the experience of great in-person online. So it has a modern and mobile UI that uh, fits today's learner, easy to use across devices. Um, but what gets me most excited is the effective nature of it. You know, it was built by learning scientists. Uh, we have a team of, of pedagogy and andragogy experts here that really focus on effective learning uh, through experiences. So we have the ability to break people into groups, work together on projects, and share those projects. And this gets to the social and engaging part. Number of features throughout the platform to engage people. You can't be effective if you're not engaging. And then, of course, being able to report. Uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. So we've built a number of reporting capabilities. So a couple of quick uh, examples. This is when a learner comes in, sees exactly what they need to do. So it's really easy to stay on track for a learner who's short on time and needs to consume materials. And they're able to do this across all devices, tablets, mobile phones, computers, and so forth. But what really gets exciting is the project-based collaboration, that they're able to come in together, form teams, work together on projects. That project could be role-playing feedback, uh, could be role-playing a, a sales scenario, could be building a sales presentation. Uh, we work with uh, IDEO who teaches design thinking and their projects are more hands-on, um, figure out how to build X, Y, Z. Uh, Stanford D School does a, a project on how to think about gum in a new way. And so uh, teams are, are asked to think about how they can use gum to solve a societal problem. So it can really get as creative and interesting as you want. Um, very common though, things like uh, leadership development, role plays and simulations. And what's great is those those projects or those cases, the work that the participants are doing, are then able to be shared with the rest of the community in the course. So it's not just submitted to an instructor or a facilitator, but it's actually shared with the community to get, to get feedback and mentorship. And so there's a number of capabilities in the platform to support one-on-one, peer-to-peer, or small group mentorship and feedback so that the community is helping each other improve. And then, as I mentioned, uh, great reporting, not just on quiz outcomes, not just on videos and who's going through the material, but also on that peer-to-peer uh, -peer and social engagement. 
So we work with a, a number of large organizations. Uh, I think of them in two groups. The first are large organizations training their employees. These are folks like GE, Comcast, uh, Nestle, ING, PTC, where they're using the platform to deliver uh, training to their, to their employees and partners. And the second group are uh, what I think of as doing client training or external training. And these are educators whose business uh, is, is training of others. So a lot of top universities and business schools like Stanford, Berkeley Haas, UVA, Darden, Wharton, uh, consulting firms like IDEO and Deloitte, as well as a number of nonprofits with educational initiatives, uh, the Dalai Lama Fellows, Sundance, and Ashoka use the platform. Uh, and what all these have in common is really using NovoEd to drive business transformation and drive uh, impact through effective and engaging online learning. But let's cut to the chase. We're really here to hear from one of our customers, uh, one of my friends and closest partners, Wendy Chase. Uh, Wendy, as I mentioned, has a very distinguished career in sales enablement uh, and pharmaceutical training. She's currently the president and owner of Chase Consulting, and before that was the head of commercial training at Sanofi Genzyme, and then previously the sales training director at Eli Lilly. So at that, let me turn it over to Wendy. Thank you, Greg, for such a warm introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm really honored to be here today with all of you and appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to join this discussion. As Greg mentioned, uh, we've got a pretty exciting topic uh, today on how to rethink online learning. You know, I truly believe online learning can and does transform business and organizations with topics like Greg had mentioned around leadership development, sales enablement, product training, disease state training, and not just that typical traditional topic of compliance, which is good training, it's just we can definitely push ourselves and have more experiential learning and training online with those other topics. And I think it really comes down to just thinking differently in our learning and development space, which is basically the goal of this conversation today. Um, I really hope we can have an interactive session, so please uh, do not hesitate to jump in at any time with questions throughout the session, just using that Q&A window that Kevin mentioned during the housekeeping details. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, guys. It, it's one of the biggest challenges that we all face in the learning and development space, and that's this concept and notion of a crossroad of innovation meets regulation. And I think it's fair to say we probably all have this in common in our business world, regardless of what industry we sit in, because frankly, in today's age, there's a few industries that are not regulated. But nevertheless, I, I think there's still an opportunity to innovate despite the regulation. And in fact, um, I, I think the regulation could actually help us with the innovation. So to be honest, of course, it's a little harder, but I know it's very doable. Um, in fact, in, in my situation, that piece of regulation, it, it really spurred the innovation in the situation that I'll talk a little bit about uh, today with all of you. So uh, as Greg alluded to, um, you know, I've spent uh, my entire career in the pharma and biotech tech space with some large and wonderful organizations. And, you know, we're in the business of helping patients and people and caregivers get better, and it's a wonderful industry to be in. We make innovative medications that can and do um, change the trajectory of someone's life. And with that, time is of the essence from the business side of things. And so while our industry makes these innovative medications, learning and development in the pharma and biotech space, is, it's a bit outdated, if I could go so far to say. Is I think many of us, um, and I've been myself, a little guilty of perhaps using the, the block of regulations from the Food and Drug Administration and things like corporate integrity agreements as a crutch. You know, it's easy to get stuck in the old ways of delivery learning experiences with a traditional approach versus pushing ourselves to be bold and have more of that experiential approach. And I think all of us, regardless of industry, we've got an opportunity to create more engaging learning experiences. <clears throat> You know, when the FDA knocks on our door in situations like 
say a product launch or a label change, maybe even like a regulatory change, and these things happen constantly. Uh, we need to move uh, really quickly to equip the sales force with things like sales engagement and product knowledge, disease state knowledge, so on and so forth. And the change of timing for each of these situations, they can be really cumbersome on a learning and development department because it really requires us to be agile and it requires us to have matching agile learning platforms. So regardless of your industry, um, I am sure most, if not all of you can relate to this. Bottom line, my take on this is we can't allow the regulation of any of our industries really be the crutch um, for learning and development. So with that, uh, now you guys have a little context of why I'm here today. I want to ground you guys in a concept that I believe we can also all relate to, and, and that's the simple notion of dating. So for all of us, you know, on the line, and there's quite a bit of us, you know, think about a time when you've been in a new relationship. You know, we're both working really hard uh, to make sure that we're making each other happy. You know, you make it extra personal and extra special for them. Um, so I'd like to draw your attention to the picture on the top left of this slide. This is the, the spark in keeping things fresh of that new relationship. You know, you do things like sending that good morning text, um, maybe even just sending flowers to the office just because it's, I don't know, Wednesday or picking up their favorite food for dinner, even when it's not really your favorite, but you wanna make it special for them. And let's not forget the best part about that new relationship. You know, we take the time to really ask questions about, you know, what are they thinking? And how do we really get to know who they are and what they want and need? And of course, active listening. And as you're going through this, you got to ask yourself, how does that really make you feel? Uh, I've got to say, in new relationships, it makes you feel good doing it for someone and also receiving it on the other end. So now I'd like to draw your attention to the picture on the right-hand side of the slide. And this is the dreaded reality of what can happen in relationships. You know, it, it isn't easy to keep that spark alive. And I'm a true believer that the best relationships are always better with intention. And so as somebody like myself who's newly engaged, uh, a very dear friend of mine uh, told me that the success to a healthy and happy marriage is for me to date him every day, which I thought, that's great insight. So you might be thinking, okay, great, Wendy, but what in the world does this dating have to do with learning and development? My thoughts on this um, are as follows. So plain and simple, guys, we hire these talented folks and we invest how much money in them? Quite a ton. And we all want them to not just succeed, we want them to thrive. We want them to not only be engaged in their role, but their team and the broader organization from not only just that first day and equally just over the long haul of their career. So as L&D leaders, my thought is, you know what? We've got to date our learners every single day. So as I mentioned, you know, it's not easy to keep that spark alive in any relationship, as you can see on that far right picture. But it's worth it for the learner. And it's also worth it for you and your team in the L&D space. It just takes a little intention and a willingness to disrupt your L&D space. I really think it's our responsibility as leaders to truly disrupt how do we engage and equip learners and prove to your organization how training can be that true business partner that impacts the bottom line, and, and that is uh, revenue. So right now, I'm going to just take a moment and pause um, and just see if anybody has any thoughts or questions on uh, the industry as well as this notion of dating them every day. Well, if there's no questions at this point, let's keep moving forward. Um, so let's dive into the agenda. So I just want to highlight four things uh, in this discussion together with you guys. One, talk about this notion of corporate buzzwords. Discuss the conundrum I found myself in. 
talk a little bit about NovoEd as a partner and why it is I chose to work with them, and then wrap up on the broader picture and, and where things are going. So in the spirit of uh, a poll, uh, because I'm really curious to get your thoughts, um, on the notion of corporate buzzwords that are my favorite after all these years in corporate America. Frankly, I, I think I can invest in a corporate buzzword bingo game and take quite, quite a few dollars on it. Um, but I'm betting I'm not alone on this. So I'd ask you guys to check out the, the webinar poll and mark down which corporate buzzwords do you hear most frequently in your company? And if you could uh, just give a rough estimate and vote in the lower right-hand corner. The words are synergy, engagement, ladder up, circle back, employee experience, do more with less, and swim lane. Now, these are just a handful. There's uh, dozens and dozens. But out of these, just curious to hear what you guys are hearing in your organization. So it looks like the poll's coming, coming in here. Gosh, not, not surprised here. It uh, looks like... Uh, we're seeing about 60% hear the word engagement. That's a big buzzword. Um, Synergy is another one, um, and doing more with less. Uh, that's interesting to hear. It's a, a fun bingo game that you guys, too, can, can play with your team. But I appreciate you guys uh, answering those. So with all seriousness on the buzzword, um, Here's the three that I've heard more often than not in my organizations, um, even with clients today. Um, I hear things like, hey, it's, it's all about engagement, and we've got to really elevate that employee experience all equally when they also say, but, you know, it's a challenging time, and we definitely have to figure out how to do more with less which is quite fascinating to me because we've got to ask ourselves, what do these things even mean? And how do we get out of corporate speak and bring these things to life? You know, are we even doing it well? And, and how do we know? So let me talk a little bit about the conundrum that I found myself in over the years. Um, so as Greg mentioned, I've been part of two uh, pretty vast organizations in the pharma biotech space. And in one organization, you know, I worked with my team to embrace the current LMS platform that they had. Um, it was a global organization and continue with what we had. It was status quo. You know, it was a good system. It delivered on the capabilities we asked for. Uh, it measured metrics. It delivered content. Um, it met the compliance regulations, but it was very traditional and was very check the box. It really wasn't until I got to the next organization where I headed up another large L and function that my exposure with different LMS platforms truly expanded. So I walked into a situation where I felt a little bit like this picture on the slide, and I don't know if any of you guys currently are feeling that or have ever felt that. Um, but just with the high level of detail, just in my space alone, gosh, we had about over 20 LMS platforms, none of which met our requirements. Um, to provide that true vision that I had of innovative and effective learning that was efficient, while at the same time being compliant. None of the platforms that we had really fit together, and they didn't really work for learners. And, and frankly, at the end of the day, and I don't think they worked for the business. So one trusted colleague um, that I have, he once asked me, you know, how do you really make the right thing to do the easy thing to do? So it started to occur to me, as I looked a lot like this picture on the slide, that, you know, maybe it wasn't worth it to band-aid all these platforms, although that was the easy thing to do, and try to figure out a partner that could up our game for the learners and for the business, because frankly, in my opinion, that was the right thing to do, having one experiential platform that could also meet the requirements we had with the FDA and, and the corporate integrity agreements that uh, most pharma companies all have. So I really wanted to push the envelope for disruption. So as you can see on this slide, there were four key buckets that um, really hindered on this conundrum that I found myself in. I mentioned the first one. The, the second was around these business pressures. Um, all of us in any industry, we always have the pressure of, you know, P&L, 
uh, you may have some product launches coming. Some of you might be experiencing company mergers, and with that comes culture clashes. And of course, good old stakeholder alignment, you know, trying to navigate the politics. I was swimming, if not drowning, uh, in these business pressures. I mentioned the third point on the plethora of the LMS platforms. Um, and the final point was we had the FDA knocking on our door. As I mentioned earlier, you know, product launches, label adjustments, uh, regulatory adjustments, those happen all the time in our industry. And with them come a lot of requirements, as well as some really unknown timelines that happen. There's kind of like a push-pull because we never really know when it's the green light to go uh, versus not. Um, <clears throat> so when faced with this conundrum, I, I really knew that we had to disrupt the learning experience and make it feel fresh and different for our learners, and more importantly, for my learning and development team. You know, we had been entrenched in this space for a long time, and none of us had ever really seen what experiential learning online could really look and feel like. So what do we do? Well, I'd like to say we went completely off the reservation, um, but that's not the case. Um, it's what I wanted to do, of course. But in actuality, I think a lot of us would probably want to go off the reservation and just be able to start fresh and new. But in the regulated environment, we had to figure out how could we be innovative in that regulated environment. So let me walk you through a high-level plan of, of how we approach this conundrum. So I knew that I needed to accomplish three things. First, I had to clean up these platforms. Um, I knew that I needed to restructure training and move it online on one learning platform in a super tight time frame. The second thing I wanted to do is I, I wanted to make sure that by doing so, we found the right platform that allowed us to infuse a culture of community. Um, that way we could really enable um, our learners to have learning experiences that were really experiential, that they were in informal cohorts. Um, something that was unique and different. And last but not least, I, I knew that I had to illuminate those buzzwords that we had all talked about earlier by dating them every day. So the common ones that I had were around engagement, experience, and do more with less. And I know many of you said the word synergy. I knew that we had to accelerate the Salesforce readiness for a product speed to market by delivering easily accessible and scalable training for that modern learning that we had. And I knew that by doing these three goals, I would establish a competitive advantage for the company and most importantly, reposition position our learning and development team as a strategic partner to really earn a seat at that table. So a couple action steps that we took. Um, boy, oh boy, we explored numerous options inside and outside our industry. I'm a huge believer you got to bring the outside in because when you just look over your fence in your industry, um, all you're going to come up with is a lot of similar things. So you got to look outside. And I learned more about LMS platforms than I could ever dream of. Um, but in the process, what our team landed on is we knew we, we didn't need another LMS to solve this problem. We actually needed a learning platform, and there was a big difference. The second thing that we did is we started small. I'm a big believer in start small um, and quickly iterate and then expand from there. You know, what you'll find is you start small, you learn, you pick up some learnings and adjust some things and tweak. You add a couple more groups, and then, gosh, before you know it, you can equip your entire enterprise. So you might be wondering, gosh, how did you do this? Um, you had to have naysayers, right? Things like do you think they're going to run into? You can't change IT. How do you align all these stakeholders so quickly? Um, I know many of you, no matter what industry you're in, you're, you're probably having the pressure of migrating to one global LMS platform for your whole organization. These are all real things uh, that did happen and we did experience. But I think the key here is just you got to find in your company what's that one thing that can't wait at your company like some requirement that's going on. Um, I know every company out there, regardless of industry, you've got something that's so important that it can't wait. 
you know, when you think about it, your, your stakeholders, they would never be okay with the notion that you'd have to ever delay whatever sort of training you're doing for something like a product launch or whatnot, despite whatever dates and deadlines or pressures, just because you couldn't fly everybody to your home office and just because you didn't have enough budget to do so. That just wouldn't fly, right? So let me pause right here before I move forward and talk about our partner that we chose and why. I'd love to get your thoughts and questions um, just on this conundrum and the plan. Wendy, there was one question on the buzzwords that I saw come in um, from Kristen. What is ladder up mean? <laughs> That's a good one. Ladder up. I, gosh, years ago, I remember when I heard ladder up, I wondered the same darn thing. Um, in essence, it, <laughs> What I've heard it means in organizations I've been with is when you, you have a, say, pieces of a project, all of them need to kind of line up to one bigger goal. Um, so sometimes folks will say ladder up. Great. And there was another question here on, can you say more what you mean by the difference between LMS and learning platform? Absolutely, and, and Greg, please weigh in too. Um, you know, like I said, I, I learned more about learning management systems than I ever knew were possible and, and frankly ever desired because that's not my expertise. Um, you know, I, I looked at the learning management systems as a, a good place to house content um, and be able to track the utilization of that content. Now, some LMSs have way more bells and whistles than others. A lot of them don't talk well with one another. Um, and when you're in a conundrum similar to myself, where you've got you know, like over 20 of them, that makes it a little bit tough. Um, I think a lot of LMSs are used for compliance training where you literally migrate content over. Um, it's like a lecture hall, you advance and you sign off. Um, when I look at a learning platform, the learning platforms really provide more that experiential learning you know, they can sit on top of your LMS, they can act as your LMS um, to really provide that experience. So, for example, uh, cohort learning, um, you know, Greg mentioned a little bit of this. Um, it can provide a look and feel where you can put people in cohorts with small groups where they can solve one problem together and they can share that with a number of people. They can self-select their cohort. You as an L&D team can assign their cohort. It's far more of that workshop experience that you would typically do live, but you actually get to do it online. Greg, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I, I was taking notes. I thought that was, that was very good. I mean, the way I think of it is the LMS was originally built to support in-person learning. It was built as a place to track attendance for in-person learning. It handled a lot of the logistics and operations of in-person programs from um, managing the facilities and the operations. It also was sort of a content management system, a place to upload documents or submit, submit assignments. Uh, it also was built to handle a lot of the HR systems integrations, connect into talent management systems, connect into uh, promotion or payroll. Um, and it later added on online learning sort of through SCORM. Like, okay, let's, let's deliver these SCORM packages. Um, so simulations or, uh, you know, PowerPoint slides essentially and videos. Whereas an online learning platform, I think of something built from the ground up for online learning. So not, you know, not really designed for in-person necessarily, but designed for online or blended uh, and really supports a wider range of kind of learning solutions of pedagogies. Um, so they definitely, there's some overlap and I think they should integrate together uh, and speak the same language, but sort of more where their focus area. One is more on sort of the back office management of the learning and the programs, and one is more about the delivery uh, of the programs themselves. <clears throat> this is why you're the expert, Greg. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. So there, there's another question here from Carl on um, how can one do more with less? Great question, Carl. Uh, I know anytime I've been um, encouraged to think that way at first, it goes, wow, that just does not seem like that's possible. 
you know, I, I think it boils down to, you know, understanding whatever that problem is you're trying to solve, right? So I can't give all these specifics because I think uh, I'd love to talk to you offline, Carl, about a specific situation. But in general, I, I think you got to ask yourself, how can you be creative to be more productive while being just very efficient with how you do things? So, for example, let's say your budget gets depleted and your headcount on your training team is reduced. However, you're still expected to deliver X, Y, and Z. How do you make that happen? Um, so one small example is, let's say your budget gets, gets really slim and you can't afford to fly people all over the country or around the world to one location. How do you work with an organization like Innovohead that provides that wonderful online, it feels like live workshop experience in a way that they can do so from their home offices or local regional offices. You still are making an investment financially in a platform. However, you're not flying folks in from all over the place, and you're not taking them away from their customers and their loved ones as well. Um, so I think it just depends on the situation. I would just encourage you to think, how can you be even more effective while being more efficient than ever? Uh, let's see. And Carl asked a follow-up question uh, around, can one leverage work with others in networking? Can, let me just make sure I understand the question, Carl. So can one leverage work and networking? And he says, does doing more with less mean thinking out of the box? Gotcha. Um, so yes. I'm, so, Carl, love the question. Um, so, I, I think the notion of thinking out of the box is in my DNA, and I hope that it's in yours, too. Um, frankly, I kind of think we got to just get rid of the box, period, and ask yourself, how can you really disrupt how it is you provide learning experiences for your organization? Um, and I, I know it's possible, and it's working with organizations like NovoEd to help you get there. Thinking out of the box or blowing up the box is the way that you can have cutting edge experiences for your learners. So I encourage people to do whiteboard exercises and brainstorming sessions and just put two words on that whiteboard and it just says, what if, question mark. Have your team just put a bunch of ideas if there were no budget restraints. Uh, if we had unlimited headcount, um, if we had numerous, an extra day in the week, whatever it might be, what if we could do X, Y, and Z? And I think that's how you can come up with very out-of-the-box ideas and find partners like InnovoEd to help your vision really come to life. Let me, you know, I can share one example that I think might help is we see a lot of our, our customers using do, doing an in-person leadership development program, I think like, like most of you, and it may happen over a kind of a weekend, maybe they fly everyone to Hawaii or you know, Vegas and do a two to three day uh, leadership development workshop where everyone comes together. And that's very expensive, but you know, often a very good experience. And so people like it, people like coming together, meeting each other. You know, it's not just training, it's also a reward. And I think sometimes Okay, so, you know, side note, I do think training programs sometimes get conflated with uh, employee recognition and uh, reward programs, um, sometimes as tax reasons so that you can write it off. But um, I think we need to separate them. And there's, you know, flying people to Hawaii to reward them is great, and we should still do that. So what happens is now you're asked to do more with less. So your budget's been cut. You can no longer bring people together. And what we saw happen is, well, okay, you start looking at, at moving it online, and the first fear is, Oh, you know, it's never going to be as good as it was. Um, but this sort of constraint starts to, to, to generate this creativity. And what we've found now is a lot of organizations are finding that the online version of that leadership development program is, is more effective and actually has better results. And, and a reason why is something you probably wouldn't have thought of um, if, you know, your budget hadn't cut and cut if you'd been able to continue, which was when you're learning something as an event, you come together and you learn about, uh, let's say it's it's giving mentoring your direct report or giving feedback to your direct report, and you learn how to do it in the workshop, and then you role play it with your peers in the workshop, uh, and then you get some more framework and some more examples. Well, then you go back to your your job a few days later, 
and you know the learning event is over and now you're trying to implement it and you sort of when you hit reality, you realize, oh, it's not quite as easy as I thought it was going to, what would be. You know, you try to deliver feedback to your direct report, and you know it just doesn't work as well. And you, what happens when you move it online now is you're able to blend the in-person and the day-to-day -day job, uh, the learning and sort of the working together. So now you're able to learn the framework, do a role play online, but then you're still working. So you go to work on Wednesday and you try it with your direct report. And you get feed, you know, it doesn't work very well. Let's say your direct report kind of gives you some feedback that, hey, this was, you know, made me feel awkward or, you know, I, whatever. And then you come back into the course and you can discuss that with your peers, discuss that with the instructor, say, hey, you know, I tried this framework. I used the four part framework you talked about, but it didn't work. Um, so now the learning is still going on. You get some feedback from your peers, the facilitator, or the mentor, or the coach in the course might give some advice. Then you try it again. Or maybe some other peers, participants in the program say, yeah, I also tried that and it didn't work for me either. But I changed these. You know, I flipped the order and I said, this, is, this uh, action you took had this effect on me and that worked better. And so you're actually, by spreading the learning out over a longer period of time, you're able to try it and apply it in the day-to-day -day job and bring it back. Um, and so we've seen people finding that moving out of a two-day in person, spreading it over two weeks or, you know, even a couple, you know, a couple months, um, has a higher impact. And so I see that as an example of having this constraint put on you, having a reduced budget, so you have to, you know, you have less, but then you actually find a way that you get a better outcome or to do more with it. So there's a couple other questions, Wendy, but I think for time, maybe we, we move forward and then we can try to answer some at the end or we can follow up uh, over email. Sounds great, thank you. All right, so the partner, Novo Ed. Um, so, you know, I decided to partner with Novo Ed for numerous reasons. Um, and there's obviously not enough time to talk about all the reasons. I, I would like just a high level highlight four of them. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, I'll just kind of go around. The, the first piece is my vision of illuminating these buzzwords, you know, really bringing to life engagement and employee experience and doing more with less. Uh, they were really able to help us have this transformative online platform that our, it's our learners, most of which, you know, were, had a varying degree of technology comfort, uh, they just were extremely impressed with what it was, how intuitive it was to use, and you know, something that they actually look forward to doing versus that check the box training. Um, they allowed us to put our own real world assignments and projects um, on this platform. And uh, it looked and feel just like it was the organization site, um, but it had the flair of no ed and all the magic behind the scenes. On the bottom left, you'll see the word agility there. Um, you know, gosh, it, agility and Novo Ed, I, I think, definitely go hand in hand, um, and they enabled us to do so. Um, I know migration of content is something that can be a little prickly at times uh, for all of us in the learning space. Um, the quick migration of content was key for us because, you know, that FDA, you just never really know when they're going to give us the green light or the red light. And we needed a partner that would allow us to even load partial programs and get folks going. And NovoEd was willing and able to do that. And that way we got our learners started. Um, while in parallel, we could finish out um, the robust content and get it over to them. Um, Greg had mentioned the, you know, that they have, uh, their platform is available on you know, mobile devices. And I gotta tell you, it, there's nothing nicer than to be able to learn right from the the fingertips of your iPad or the flexibility on, you know, your laptops back and forth. You have those options. Um, in terms of the care, far bottom right-hand corner, you know, I'm a big believer in character and competence. And Novo Ed offered both that competence and the character. I think the icing on the cake, though, is, is the piece around caring. Uh, when you've got a big, bold, disruptive vision, like transforming online learning uh, for your organization to actually be experiential and not check the box. It's nice to know that you've got a partner who gets that. 
They really care about the learner experience and they get the buzzwords. They get what engagement is and what experience means and how to do more with less. And most importantly, they get the concept of dating your learners every day, making it really special. Um, remember, I mean, you hire all these folks and you invest a lot of money in them and you just want them to thrive with your organization in their role from the, from the first day in the long haul. And Novo Ed really understood that and shared that. Um, it's not easy to keep that spark alive um, for your learners, but as L&D leaders, I believe it's our role to do so. And Novo Ed really helped bring that to life. Now, there are a ton more reasons, and if you'd like to continue this conversation offline, I'd love to share a lot more details with you. But in high-level summary, you know, these are four things that they did consistently well and much better um, than some of the other organizations out there. And working with Greg Bybee and Bob Cronin is uh, nothing short of a delight. So in the interest of time, I just have uh, two more brief things with you guys. Let's just talk a little bit about where we're going, the broader picture, um, as it pertains to innovation in L&D. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, let's just not keep looking over the fence in our own industry, in our own backyard. You know, I really think we have to look around the globe. We've got to look at different industries. We've got to look at industries that are regulated, which are the vast majority, but even those that aren't. You've got to look for some bright spots that you too can replicate in your own company. When you bring the outside into your organization, it, that will transform your learning, your learners, um, and as well as your team. So I, I will say that this is definitely not a unique situation. Um, you know, as Greg mentioned, currently I'm doing consulting now, and I'm a consulting partner that prides myself on offering customizable leadership development sales training and executive coaching like experiences um, for folks that have a fierce desire to learn and grow. Um, and I'm so excited to get to work with some of my clients because they too, they want to disrupt their learning and development teams. They just don't know how. Um, you know, my clients, they've got the same elephant in the room as you and I do. They're at that crossroad of how innovation meets regulation and, and what do you do? Um, but it's definitely doable. You know, one of my goals with my clients is to really help them see the value of making that employee experience really special and thinking about investing in the people with um, ongoing learning and development with capabilities across what I offer and leveraging online learning. Um, it's not just a nice to have anymore. It, it really is a need to have. And, you know, bottom line, um, regardless of your industry, I definitely know that uh, online learning, it, it is transforming business, and it is transforming organizations all around the globe. So we've talked about quite a bit in a brief amount of time. I just want to leave you guys um, with three key concepts, and, of course, would love to continue the conversation offline. But it's really that notion of, as you're thinking about disrupting your learning and development space, remember to date them every day. You know, what can you do to make it extra special for your learners and keep that spark alive? I really encourage you guys to bring those buzzwords to life because it's one thing to say synergy and experience and all of those things, but it's another to bring it to life. And most importantly, don't let regulation stop innovation in your industry. Find that one thing in your company, that one requirement that's so important that it can't wait and push the envelope and work with an organization like Novo Ed uh, to get online learning that's experiential in, in your organization. <laughs>